Until now, we've been talking about the late Bronze Age collapse as if it were a man-made phenomenon. Human war, human migrations, human greed, the collapse of human political structures. But sometimes, even when human beings do everything absolutely right, nature fucks us anyway. Recently, a friend and I had one of those conversations that millennials often have, one of those depressing and pessimistic ones about which of the potential horrors of the near future we are the most scared of. Be it nuclear annihilation or radical climate change, those were the big two. And of course, it could very easily be both. Maybe climate change creates the conditions for increasing tensions between the nuclear powers around the globe, and eventually World War III breaks out, and it's a combined effort of these two disasters that get us. Or it could be neither if we get very, very, very clever very, very, very quickly. But even if we can guarantee that neither climate change nor nuclear war wipes us out, you know, in the very near future, something else could always get us. I mean, Yellowstone could erupt or a newer, deadlier virus could break out. My point is, sometimes catastrophes come about as a result of other people and sometimes it's nature herself. And it's the latter that we're going to focus on today, using such long and exciting words as archaeoseismology and isotope and drill. Quick disclaimer here, I'm not a scientist. I don't know that much about climate science or any of the studies behind like natural disasters and things like that. So if you're looking for an in-depth look into how we know this stuff, I'm really only going to skim the surface. When historians, archaeologists and anthropologists first started looking into the potential causes of this late Bronze Age collapse, the first things they went to were the man-made causes. You know, the sea peoples were very, very popular for a while. War between the great states or the societal collapse. But as time went on, they began to consider other factors like natural disaster and how these might have also played a greater role than first suspected. One of the first of these theories was put forward by a man called Claude Frédéric Almand Schaeffer, who was the excavator of the wealthy Syrian city of Ugarit. Now, initially, like many, he thought that this city had been destroyed by the Sea Peoples, but as time went on, he began to suspect that it might have been an earthquake instead. His reasoning came from the discovery of a tablet, which is often referred to as the General's Letter, and the tablet has on it a request by a commander of Ugaritic and allied forces south of the city for more reinforcements from his liege lord. His reasoning being that he suspects that the pharaoh of Egypt is planning an offensive very, very soon up into Syria. So Schaefer sees this and concludes that in the early 12th century, Ugarit and Egypt were hostile to each other. And you know who else was hostile to Egypt at this time? That's right, the Sea Peoples. So if the Sea Peoples and Ugarit are both fighting Egypt, they'd surely make natural allies. And if they were allies, why would the Sea Peoples ever attack Ugarit. Now, if all of this seems like a wild assumption, you're right. We're not even sure that the General's letter is actually dated to the early 12th century. A lot of people say it comes from a hundred years earlier. And anyone who's written about this theory of Schaefer's, or anyone that I've read at least, always feels the need to point out that they think this is a tad far-fetched. But Schaefer wasn't the only one revising old theories here. In the 1980s, uh, the Argolid in Greece was excavated by a man called Klaus Killian, who also believed it was an earthquake that had taken down the Mycenaean palatial centers here. He discovered a bunch of hastily erected kind of shanty towns just outside of the ruins, which he believed were built by the survivors of the earthquake directly after their city collapsed. So let's, for the sake of argument, assume that these assessments are correct. After all, most people trust the excavators when it comes to these things because no one knows the site better than the guy that fucking dug it up in the first place. The whole earthquake hypothesis begs the question, if these people were capable of building cities like Mycenae, Pylos and Tiryns, why did they abandon them so quickly after an earthquake caused a bit of damage? After all, the Eastern Mediterranean is one of the most seismically active parts of the globe. So you'd think earthquakes were something that they'd be prepared for if they lived there for a long time. Well, you know what? They probably did. They probably were prepared for earthquakes. I mean, they wouldn't have had the technology like we do nowadays to predict them in advance, but they'd have certainly learned to live with the possibility of an earthquake. But what about several of them? From the 1930s through to the 1960s, which 
coincidentally is also the time that the theory of plate tectonics was punching its way into the mainstream of scientific thought and conversation. The area of Anatolia was hit by a number of destructive earthquakes all in a row. And pretty soon scientists were talking about earthquake sequences or earthquake storms. An earthquake storm is basically when one big earthquake massively disrupts the Earth's skin, basically. And so uh, everything's all uneven and as it all shakes itself back into place, you get many, many other earthquakes all in quick succession. And these storms are incredibly dangerous if you happen to live on a fault line, like the Mykonians did. So perhaps the reason they never rebuilt had less to do with the fact that they were unprepared for earthquakes, you know, at all, and more to do with the fact that every time they rebuilt, Poseidon would just send another and another and another, and eventually they decided it wasn't worth it anymore. But remember, we're still taking for granted the fact that these specific excavators were correct in their assessment that it was an earthquake that destroyed these cities, which is a pretty risky thing to do because not all excavators agree on that. So let's have a look at the evidence and see how likely it is that earthquakes took down the Mykonians. So to start with, how is it exactly that archaeologists determine whether or not it is nature or human beings that destroy something? Well, there's a list of criteria that earthquake victims share. So for example, buildings foundations that are severely askew. You know, the kind of thing that can only really be done when the earth itself moves. Another rather morbid way of telling whether or not it was an earthquake is dead bodies. So people who are preserved in the position they died having been crushed by something. Or, you know, some things that earthquakes don't do. So if you see a guy with an arrow sticking out of his neck, that's less likely an earthquake and more likely another person. This is also an age before they could predict earthquakes. So signs of evacuation or people actually making it out of the city are really quite rare. And then there's the factor that Killian himself focused on. The construction of simpler, anti-seismic architecture directly after the quake. So say you and your fellow survivors have just seen your city completely fall apart, what have you got to do? You've got to build yourself a new home. But if earthquakes are becoming fairly common, you're probably not going to build a skyscraper. You're more likely to build a wooden shed that if it collapses in on you at any point, probably won't kill you and all of your family. And this seems to be what the people of the Argolid did directly after the destruction of their cities. So as an example, let's take Mykini, the largest of the Greek palaces, the one so big and so impressive that the entire civilization is named after it. So Mykini seems to have been hit with two bouts of destruction about a generation apart. There's a first one, probably caused by an earthquake, which, you know, damages the city and then the people rebuild afterwards. And then a few decades later, they're hit by a second one. That's the one that we're going to focus on. This more destructive disaster happened around 1190-ish. And it's the interesting one because it's the one that Mykini doesn't recover from. And this second destruction was characterized mainly by intense, intense fires. The kind of heat that can only be created by a city-wide blaze. Nowadays, fires are quite common in earthquakes, sadly, because we have things like gas pipes and electrical cables. But even back in the day, you know, your average household would have been heated and lit by an open fire, the kind of thing that can really go wrong when things start collapsing in on each other and maybe, you know, the weather whips up a little bit. And it is very, very possible, if not probable, that it was an earthquake that caused these fires. After all, Mykini ticks a great deal of our earthquake boxes. We have bodies of entire families crushed under the weight of their own homes. The foundations of those homes, preserved by the fact that the intense fire cooked the mud brick they were made out of, are horrifically askew, you know, as if the ground itself were moving. And the same is true of Turin's and Medea, other Argolid sites whose foundations are all over the place and in which skeletons have been found of people buried underneath the rubble of their own homes. Okay, so we can say that there is a strong possibility that the Mykonian cities in the 12th century BCE were destroyed by earthquakes. That is not the same as saying that the Bronze Age collapse happened as a result of earthquakes. After all, the Mykonians are only one small part of this huge Bronze Age world. Is there anything to suggest that, you know, Anatolia fell as a result of the same thing, or the cities of the Levant? And what about Ugarit? Was Schaefer right in his assessment that that wealthy Syrian city was permanently abandoned as a result of the earth shaking too much? Well, probably not. Or at least I'm far from convinced for three main reasons. 
Firstly, the site of Ugarit was never reoccupied. The locals buried their valuables and then fled and never returned for them. And there's no sign of the kind of hastily erected shanty town that the refugees from this earthquake might have lived in afterwards outside Ugarit like there is in the cities of Greece. Secondly, there are arrowheads everywhere in Ugarit. Earthquakes don't use bows. And thirdly, unlike with the Mycenaeans, we have textual evidence for the destruction of Ugarit. The famous, famous letters begging for help because of the hordes of enemy ships coming to attack the city. In fact, when it comes to textual evidence, most of it points to violent man-made destruction. The tablets from Ugarit and Ramses III's inscriptions in Egypt all talk about it being the Sea Peoples or other affiliated groups that took down the major Bronze Age centers like Hattusa, Ugarit, Carchemish, Imar, etc. And then on top of that, there's the inherent problem of blaming earthquakes for total collapse. And that problem being that earthquakes don't usually cause total collapse. As terrifying as an earthquake storm sounds, and I'm sure they are if you're in the middle of one, they're not apocalyptic. I mean, like I said, there was one in this region in the 20th century, and that didn't cause the collapse of civilization in Anatolia. I mean, small-scale earthquake storms happen fairly regularly, and very rarely does it seem that the entirety of civilization and a large world of interconnected states and trade and writing and all that good stuff just fucking disappears as a result. Now, although there's an argument to be made that in our modern era we are better prepared for earthquakes than we've ever been, I mean, we can predict them now, and anti-seismic architecture is pretty advanced, dealing with earthquakes isn't new. Earthquakes predate human beings, so as long as our species has existed, we've dealt with them. I mean, take Constantinople, for example. It lies on one of the most earthquake-prone areas on the planet. And yet for a thousand years, it was immensely prosperous and probably one of the best places to live that there was. And when it finally did fall in 1453, rest in peace, it wasn't as a result of an earthquake. It was because the Turks rocked up outside with a big fuck off cannon. Going back even further, in 460 BCE, Sparta was hit by a huge earthquake. One so bad it killed loads of them and resulted in a massive slave uprising. But Sparta recovered and in less than a hundred years, it was the most powerful state in all of Greece. In fact, throughout history, earthquakes and natural disasters have been constant. And almost all of the time, people, if they can, recover and rebuild. So if it was an earthquake that destroyed the Mycenaean palatial centers, why is it that they didn't? Well, Dr. Beverly Goodman, who's built her career in this relatively new field of study of ancient natural disasters, has this to say about it. When you have any environmental change or disaster, slow or fast, some of what happens afterwards is a reflection of the state of the society at the time. So, if what happens after an earthquake here is total collapse, what kind of a reflection is that on late Bronze Age society? Why is it that they couldn't rebuild and recover? Could it be that there was something else already undermining the strength of these states before the earthquake was perhaps the straw that broke the camel's back. Invasions, war, political upheaval, maybe. But the textual evidence suggests one other factor, famine. <clears throat> Seeing as we're talking about the weather and the temperature and climate and all of that stuff, I thought I'd do the next bit of this video outside, but as soon as I stepped out, the sun went away. Now it's all overcast, might even rain soon, so. Fingers crossed. That's just British weather for you, isn't it? So climate change, drought, famine, all of these things have been the subject of increasingly popular theories over the last few years to explain not only the Bronze Age collapse, but also the, as the root cause of other factors that might have led to it, like the mass migrations of people, increased warfare, raiding, things like that. It all started in 1965, when a guy called Rhys Carpenter suggested that the populations of Greece decreased massively post the year 1200 due to a prolonged drought. This theory quickly went out the window, though, when new evidence came to light showing us that the population of Greece didn't really drastically decrease, it simply moved. People went away from the large cities, the huge population centers of the Mycenaean era, and instead set up smaller, autonomous cities. So kind of lots and lots of little settlements instead of just a few big ones. But the literary evidence kept the idea of things like drought going, and it was used both to argue for and against it. So for example, those who believed drought was a very serious factor in the Bronze Age collapse 
could point to the seemingly increased importance of grain shipments. Oh, the cuneiform tablets show us that in the 13th century, the Hittite Empire seems to have begun to suffer a little bit of a food shortage. The Queen of Hatti even sends a letter to the Pharaoh of Egypt saying, there is no grain in my lands. And despite the fact that the Egyptian and Hittite empires were at war with each other for a fair bit of the 13th century, only a few years into the peace, they're setting up treaties so that uh, Egyptian grain shipments are always constantly reliably making their way north to Anatolia to keep the Hittites afloat. Oh, it's the fuzz. We can infer that this grain shortage was probably fairly serious from the fact that turning to Egypt seems like a last resort. I mean, the Hittites and Egyptians were mortal enemies, remember? So it must have been really embarrassing to turn to the incredibly arrogant pharaoh and give him the satisfaction of having helped the Hittites out. Ideally, they'd probably want to rely more on their own vassals. And it seems that they were trying to rely on their own vassals to start with, but those very vassals were suffering shortages themselves. I mean, the last king of Ugarit, Amurapi, gets chastised by the Hittite king for not sending enough food up to his liege in Hatti. And you can't really blame Ugarit. The poor city was completely overrun with requests for food aid. I mean, the nearby city of Imar even sent them a letter saying, There is famine in your house, and we will all die of hunger. If you do not arrive quickly here, we ourselves will die of hunger. And yet in these same years that Ugarit is being pressed to provide aid to its neighbours and its overlord, they themselves seem to have been suffering from a bit of a food shortage. I mean, Pharaoh Menepta of Egypt states with great pride how he's sending grain shipments to Ugarit because he's trying to relieve it of its famine. I mean, maybe on its own, Ugarit wasn't suffering the most severe shortage in the world, but it was clearly having to prop up all of its neighbours, which would have exacerbated its own situation if there was a shortage at all. And maybe if there was a food shortage, that's what fueled the Sea Peoples to go on their grand expedition of destruction, if that really existed. I mean, the larger states like the Hittites, the Egyptians, and all of their vassal kingdoms, they were keeping themselves propped up by cooperating with each other, by sharing the food around, by putting aside past grievances and uh, sending aid regardless. But uh, the Sea Peoples, who probably came from smaller states with considerably less influence, didn't have those options. So it may have led them through hunger, starvation, and desperation to go on this risky venture. And you know, deciding to up and take your entire population, your family, your friends, and take a risk that we know doesn't work out for them because the Sea Peoples get wiped out in Egypt eventually, supposedly after destroying most of the Bronze Age world. That's something you only do if you're desperate. It's, you know, like we said in the Sea Peoples video, it's comparable to an almost refugee crisis if those refugees are heavily armed and violent. You know, like, um, it still stems from desperation. In this case, probably desperation through a lack of food. And, you know, I feel the need to slap yet another big maybe over all of this. I mean, we're still connecting a lot of very scattered dots here with this famine theory. And there's a lot of evidence that the Sea Peoples weren't driven to what they did by hunger. Why is it that they didn't appropriate the fertile fields of the lands that they supposedly destroyed? Why in many cases did they choose to burn the food stores of the cities they sacked instead of taking that food? I mean, a people driven to desperation because of hunger don't tend to waste food, you know? And this is the trouble with the kind of literary evidence that we have to try and piece these theories together. There's such a lack of it, and that what we do have um, can kind of argue both sides. For example, we have an Ugaritic tablet from the time that tells us that items of clothing were often more valuable in cost than livestock, um, which doesn't make sense for a population on the brink of starvation. I mean, no one gives a fuck about fashion when they're seriously malnourished. In Greece, we get absolutely zero mention of a drought or a famine in any of our Linear B tablets. Um, so remember the Greeks, the Mycenaeans, have an incredibly centralized command economy. So it seems like most farmers would farm their crop, give it all to the palace, and the palace redistributes it among the people. And right up until the palace is destroyed, these rations remained incredibly generous. In fact, in the year 1200 BCE, the average Mycenaean woman is getting 128% of her required daily calories every single day, which, you know, good for her. That, that kind of thing doesn't indicate that there's a food shortage going on. So as you can see, the debate was ongoing for a while, with nothing conclusive to really give us a good idea of what kind of a role things like drought, famine, 
climate change or natural disaster played in the Late Bronze Age collapse. But whilst historians, anthropologists and archaeologists were arguing with the limited evidence that they had, science was coming to the rescue. In the 21st century, new methods of measuring the climate of the past were finally put into use. And uh, what they do is they take the mineral deposits that were left by rivers over time and they'd use that to analyze pollen from thousands of years ago. I get hay fever personally, so this, uh, this field of study really isn't for me. They also do isotope analysis and something to do with sediment cores, which uh, science people tell me is how they can tell what the weather was like 3,000 years ago. And historians trust the science people, so I trust historians, and so I trust the science people, I suppose. The conclusion they came to is that the Late Bronze Age collapse coincided with a few centuries of particularly arid climate. And uh, this meant that there was less rain, and therefore with less rain, less crops grow. Boom, there you go. So yeah, it seems that the huge catastrophe we're trying to explain timeline-wise, coincided with a sequence of earthquake storms and some less than fortunate climate change. But much like with the previous theories we've explored, like that of the Sea People's changes in warfare, this seems like too little on its own to be the root cause. Like we said earlier, there's a pretty good model for what human beings do when faced with disasters like this. They rebuild and they recover. There's often quite a bit of change after they recover, especially if the disaster is bad, but there's also usually quite a bit of continuity. On their own, they're very rarely enough to cause a complete collapse as total as this one, especially in a region of the world where the climate is historically quite unpredictable and things like earthquakes and famines are fairly common. Almost every scholar arguing for this does so in a kind of we should take these factors more seriously, but not as a sole explanation type of tone. Eric Klein, who has written several articles and a book, which takes factors like climate change and famine more seriously than many other historians, still feels the need to really emphasize that this can't have been the sole cause of the collapse, or at least as far as we know, because if this video has emphasized anything more than the other videos that I've done in this series so far, it's that every decade, new, discover, new discoveries are being made, which sometimes blow old theories right out the water or revitalize and breathe life into theories that previously had been, you know, sidelined or perhaps only believed by a niche few historians. But the other thing that's become clear in these last four videos of looking at the various factors that might have caused the Bronze Age collapse is that there's no way any of them could have worked on their own. Take the Sea Peoples, for example. They can't have just, well, they wouldn't have just set off on their path of destruction without some kind of root cause. And the same with these, uh, with these natural disasters. You know, a couple of earthquakes and maybe a few bad harvests doesn't lead to the complete destruction of all of these civilizations. Maybe one of these factors was symptomatic of another, but even then they seem to all be working together like a kind of perfect storm. No historian that I've read truly believes that one of these factors was the sole culprit here. The murder of the Bronze Age wasn't the work of a single individual, it was the whole village. This is the basis behind systems collapse and related theories the kind of thing that most modern historians blend environmental and climate factors into. And it is within that, which we're going to explore in more detail next time, that I think the closest thing to an answer lies. Did you know that when Krakatoa erupted, it was so loud that the sound wave travelled around the circumference of the Earth more than six times? More than six times? Well, yeah, seven times, precisely, but you get it. Yeah, volcanoes are big. Volcanoes are big. Remember like 10 years ago when Iceland just fucking blew up out of nowhere and air travel just came to a halt all of a sudden. I was trapped in South Africa for weeks because of that. It's wild to think that in our modern age, even with all the technology we have and we can prepare for these things, sometimes nature just throws you a curveball. You can't do anything about it. Case in point, the pandemic. The pandemic, exactly, COVID. I mean, even like we take another pandemic, the Spanish flu, in a shorter time, probably killed more people than the entire First World War did. I mean, you know, like, we always see history 
as being the story of human beings doing things to each other. But in reality, often, like, nature or disease or just the fucking weather steps in and makes our decisions for us. Could make a good video, even. That would make a good video, you know. Cut. Let's see how that looks.